there were some key statements made as follows. And this, these mostly were made by Elon Musk. There is a clear path to a fully sustainable energy earth or economy. Welcome to another Climate Emergency Forum. My name is Charles, and I'll be your host today. We'll be discussing Tesla's Master Plan Part 3, which was presented at Investor Day on March 1st. The content of this presentation has been published in a white paper. We'll provide links to both the presentation and the white paper in the description. Wow, well, this was quite a paper, and I'd like to do a more of a high-level overview of the paper, and then Peter and uh, Neil and Paul will break it down in a little bit more detail. By the way, we do have a special guest today, which I'll be introducing once I'm finished giving my segment here. So... There were some key statements made as follows, and this, these mostly were made by Elon Musk. There is a clear path to a fully sustainable energy earth or economy. It doesn't require destroying natural habitats. It doesn't require us to be austere and to stop using electricity. So the paper for, provides a very clear statement of the numbers involved, which I'll repeat as follows. So the paper says, in order to go and transition to a fully sustainable energy economy, we're going to need approximately 240 terawatt hours of energy storage. We're going to need to be able to generate 30 terawatts of power. We're going to need uh, approximately uh, an investment of $10 trillion. And the amount of energy that we will require for this sustainable economy will be approximately half of what we use today in our fossil fuel-based economy. So half the amount of energy. And they give very specific numbers. They say today's economy consumes 165 petawatt hours. And so they use the, the units of petawatts, which is really, it's 10 to the 15th power. Petawatt is the same as a thousand terawatts uh, or a million gigawatts. Yeah, so today's uh, fossil fuel economy consumes 165 petawatt hours per year. And it's proposed that the sustainable economy will consume half that, and they gave a number of 82 petawatt hours per year. And a lot of that reduction in the amount of energy is due to end use efficiency. So now what I want to do is I want to mention the six point plan. They give a very, they break down their plan. Like these are the high level numbers that I've given you. So by the way, the $10 trillion, they mentioned that it's 10% of 2022's GDP. And the other bold statement they make is insurmountable transition challenges. And they put in uppercase letters, zero. In other words, they emphasize that this is all feasible. Then what they do is they break it down into six a six-point plan. So the six-point plan involves one, renewable power, which uh, will uh, reduce fossil fuel use by 35% once we cut over to that. And that involves 46 petawatt hours per year. Uh, then they, when we switch to EVs, that will provide a 21% reduction in fossil fuel use, and that's approximately 28 petawatt hours. Then when we switch to heat pumps, that will re uh, reduce fossil fuel use by 22% and, and involves 29 petawatt hours. 
and high temperature heat processes, and they divide that into less than 200 C and greater than 200 C. And overall, it's 17% reduction in fossil fuels, 22 petawatt hours. And the last element they mention is sustainable fuel for planes and boats, which is a 5% reduction in fossil fuels and a total of seven petawatt hours. And they do acknowledge they likely will require the production of synthetic fuels uh, in the short term. But they do mention that the planes are possible with energy battery energy densities of 450 watt hours per kilogram or better. And those are available now, but they're still very expensive. And so the final sixth part of their plan involves the manufacturing, I say the manufacturing of the C, S-E-E, and S-E-E stands for Sustainable Energy Economy. And so that's pretty well a high-level view of the plan. Now, what I would like to do is I'd like to introduce a guest on our show. He has written many of the blog posts on the Climate Emergency Forum website, and his name is Neil Kitching. Neil Kitching is a geography graduate from Scotland who worked as a chartered accountant for 20 years. So he knows numbers. He made a successful career change to work to promote sustainable development policy for a government agency. He is now a member of the Institute of Water and Works as an energy specialist However, he remained frustrated knowing that humans were slowly ruining our planet. Most people seemed to be blissfully unaware, and he was not doing anything about it. Hence, he wrote a book, a very good book, which I've had a chance to read, called Carbon Choices. And so once again, I'm very happy to introduce you to Neil Kitching. Hi, Neil. Hi, Charles. Thank you very much for the introduction. And just to explain, I'm going to bring uh, Tesla's master plan right down to earth, so right down to basics. So rather than looking at your gigawatts across the world economy, I'm going to be talking for five minutes about my own personal experience in my own house. So just to explain, I live in a very standard um, three-bedroomed house in the suburbs of Dunblane. Uh, so Dunblane's a, a town in Scotland and if any of you follow tennis, uh, Andy Murray is the most famous person that's ever been born in Dunblane. Uh, so like almost everybody else, 80 to 90 percent of houses in Scotland are heated by gas or natural gas as some people call it, although it's, it's actually methane. We've been brought up on cheap energy from the North Sea but uh, more recently that's been running out and we're now importing over 50% of our gas, a lot of it from Norway, but some from as far away as the Middle East. And of course, gas is, uh, methane is a, a strong greenhouse gas. So when I looked at my carbon footprint uh, for the home, it was about two and a half tonnes of carbon from burning gas in our own boiler or, or furnace and about only half a ton from uh, use of electricity at home. So in Scotland, we have quite a low carbon electricity grid. There's a lot of wind, there's a lot of nuclear, and then there's some gas. Uh, so I thought I needed to get myself completely off gas. And the way forward for that was to install a heat pump. Um, so I installed uh, just last winter, a seven kilowatt valiant air to water heat pump. So air to water, it's extracting the, the warm air from outside and it's been used to eat up, heat up the water in a hot water tank, and that's circulated around very traditional uh, wet radiators throughout the house. Uh, that cost me £12,000, which I think is around 20000 Canadian dollars. Uh, but then I got a £7,000 grant from the government to offset a lot of that cost. But I went a lot further than that. I also installed four and a half kilowatt peak of solar on the roof of our house. And that cost around about £6,000. Then I installed a battery, 15 kilowatt peak battery, and that was about the same cost again, another £6,000. And for that, I got an interest-free loan from the government. So I was trying to go, well, not trying to go, I did go all electric. Uh, I then paid our electricity company to 
uh, cut the gas supply off from our house, which was a great feeling and meant uh, we no longer pay standing charges for the gas. So the consequences of all that, uh, the house is kept warm. It's kept at a fairly warm temperature all day long. But uh, what's interesting around the costs is that electricity is about three times the cost of gas, at least it is in the United Kingdom. But fortunately, the heat pump works at 300% efficiency. So if you just replace gas with a heat pump, you'll end up with a utility bill that's more or less the same as before. But there's several magical things that then flow out of that. So I changed tariff to a tariff which has cheap rates and a cheap, some cheap hours and some more expensive hours. And I can warm up my home primarily during those cheap rates. And with a heat pump, you can do that and it stays fairly warm throughout afterwards. So that reduces the overall cost of a utility bill. I uh, also have the solar panels. So obviously, particularly in the summer, we get a lot of sunshine, a lot of daylight. And that provides free electricity. Uh, so in the summer, I'm not needing to heat the home, but the, the solar is supplying all of my hot water and uh, the surplus is exported to the grid. And then the battery, I think the battery is what really makes a difference. So in the summer, the battery charges up from the solar. So it's charging up for free. And then that's running electricity through the evening and the night. So I'm expecting from now until the end of August to have almost a zero electricity bill. In the winter, I can change the battery mode. So it will charge up automatically from the grid, but at the cheap rates overnight. So instead of paying the usual 35 pence a unit, I can charge my battery at 20 pence a unit, and then that will run the heat pump throughout the day. So it's really the, the magic of combining the heat pump with solar and particularly with a battery that brings the running costs a long way down. Obviously, there's a lot of capital expenditure, a lot of outlay up front, but in my case, that was helped by an interest-free loan. So really, the summary of all that is my carbon emissions for the home have gone from three tonnes of carbon dioxide emitted every year down to 0 0.8 tonnes of carbon dioxide. So that's a 70% reduction. That's a big reduction. That's not a small 10% reduction. That's a 70% reduction. And as our electricity grid goes down to net zero, which is planned for by 2035, so the 0 0.8 tonnes will go down to more or less zero. And then I'll have a carbon-free warm house, which will be fantastic. And from the money perspective, my electricity and gas bill previously was around two and a half thousand pounds per year. So what's that? Maybe four thousand Canadian dollars. I think that will fall to about one thousand pounds this year. So again, that's a, a huge reduction. So that's my very small experience. I haven't said I've also bought a second hand Nissan Leaf electric car. And um, so again, that's trying to stop me from burning diesel and petrol and moving to a much more green future. You know, going back to the Tesla report, I think there's a lot in it. Could you scale me up across the world? I don't know, but it's certainly the right direction for us to be going. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. And your story is very inspiring to me. I aspire to do what you've done. I think it's really amazing. You've done three things in your house, the heat pump, the battery and the solar panels. And then on top of that, for your transport, the EV as well. So that is really amazing and uh, congratulations on that. And now I'd like to hand it over to Peter. Hi, Peter. Oh, hi, Charles. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed the uh, description of what each of us can do and all we can do as a family. And um, that's great information because uh, we all got to get in on uh, on uh, getting off fossil fuels. So there are two things I really, really immediately liked about the Tesla plan. And of course, the first one is that he said uh, the plan is to end fossil fuels. It's actually very, very rare for me to see that nowadays. So I, I really welcome that because if we don't have a plan and we don't aim to get off fossil fuels 100%, then we have no future. Nothing else is going to work, obviously. The other thing that uh, really interested me 
was that he'd been uh, discussing with one of my heroes, certainly Mark Jacobson, out of Stanford. And Mark Jacobson has the uh, plan of just wind, solar, and water. And uh, he's had that uh, for a long, long time. I think, you know, I think his first paper on it was 2009 or something way, way, way back. Anyway, that's been going a long time. And um, out of that, we have the uh, Solutions Project. So Mark has worked out a plan for pretty well every country in the world now. So hearing that that Mark uh, approved of the Tesla plan was really uh, reassuring for me. We have to do Mission Impossible. Um, because the IPCC made it very clear that global emissions have to decline, quote, immediately, quote, rapidly. In fact, and that's the two degrees C, which, of course, is catastrophe. Uh, In fact, the global emissions should have been in decline at the very latest by 2020. And that's been the IPCC situation for many, many, many years. So having a um, a very influential, wealthy entrepreneur behind this is really a big thing. That's a very big deal because he uh, he can push hard financially and economically. However, we still face the fact that our governments are doing exactly the opposite. So our governments are still subsidizing the fossil fuel industry, They're not charging the fossil fuel industry the costs of pollution. People talk about carbon tax, but the carbon tax has to be on the central source of pollution, which, of course, is the fossil fuel corporations. And our governments are obstructing that, as they have been for years and years and years. So I think that we have to have a campaign, civil society, political campaign as well to get our fossil fuels. I don't think we'll get off fossil fuels completely with just having a lot of renewable energy available, although obviously we can't get off them without doing that. So that would really be be my comments. And uh, again, uh, the more we can encourage people and families to get on board, the better. Thank you, Peter. And thank you for all your points. And I agree that it's great having a, a large company that's doing very well uh, behind this renewable, sustainable transition plan. And, and I agree with you that, our, that it probably will entail a little bit of a, a fight. We're going to have to kind of swim upstream to uh, enable this transition. But it's nice to know that the Tesla plan, it lays it out very clearly and there's lots of numbers there to dig into. And they do actually encourage people to, you know, comment and provide feedback on their plan. And I'm really happy to hear that uh, Mark Jacobson has approved the plan. That's that's significant. So that's really good to know that. And, and thank you for that. I'd like to now call on Paul to weigh in on Tesla's master plan part three. Paul, it, have you had a chance to read the paper? And and if so, what do you think? Yes, um, I did uh, have a chance to read the paper, the white paper. And also, I like the, the way they've been sort of marketing or getting this information out because the original uh, March 1st Investor Day, of course, was to Tesla shareholders. But they want, obviously, you know, obviously it's a very involved plan that involves not just uh, Tesla companies' products, but you know, many other, you know, it it involves lots of different aspects of renewable energy for the most part. And and I agree that it's great that Mark Jacobson is on board with this because he's been making claims that our entire society can transfer over to renewables about about a decade to, to switch everything over. And unfortunately, what we're seeing happen now is that the world energy demand is still rising. And most of the new stuff that is coming on board is renewables, but the the fossil fuel component is not being reduced. In fact, it's getting more and more funding, more and more subsidies, including from Canadian banks. And, and it needs more and more money to, to stay at par even because 
you know, uh, it's becoming a lot harder to, to get oil and gas out of the ground. I mean, fracking, for example, which, you know, is part of the natural gas. I don't like the name natural gas, but the, the, the methane boom, you know, that was touted as a bridge fuel, if you remember, to buy us time, to, you know, a bridge fuel between oil and uh, renewables. And of course, uh, you know, then it kind of took over on its own. And now methane levels are rising extremely rapidly in the air and methane's a very, very uh, potent greenhouse gas. But, you know, I like what Musk and Tesla is doing. I mean, Elon Musk has been, you know, behind the, all his companies, if you look at it, he's very, you know, worried about humans maintaining a presence, you know, on this planet. He thinks it's too risky and we need to, you know, diversify to different places. Yeah, so I really like th this particular plan. And it looks like, you know, you talked about, Charles, the 240 terawatt hour of storage is the goal. And, you know, this is, of course, from, from uh, you, you know, Tesla's building these gigafactories and producing these power walls and very extremely large storage batteries. And some countries, I think Australia notably, are, uh, have actually or put in orders for some of these very large power storage so they, they can store electricity. There's also lots of different ideas for power storage in reservoirs at altitude, for example, pump water up to a reservoir at altitude, and then you can let the water out to gen generate electricity from turbines and things. And th that's a you know very, very efficient way to do it. Other companies are looking at flywheels and uh, things like that. I mean, there's lots of, you know, that's a growing space and the cost of the storage is going down. It's plummeting, it, same as the cost of the panels and the cost of uh, wind turbines and so on. Although we do have to be careful about where we're sourcing all of the minerals, you know, the, the metals, the rare metals, et cetera, for powering the renewable industry. But 240 terawatts of storage you know, if we're generating 30 terawatts of power generation, that's about eight hours. So I guess they figure they figure about eight hours of storage should be should be uh, sufficient for the system. Of course, you know, the 10 trillion dollars is a lot of money. But as you mentioned, it's 10 percent of, of the GDP in one year. And that's the capital. That's the capex, which is the capital expenses. You know, once you have the systems built, the OPEX, the, the, the money that you need to spend to keep these things running is way, way lower than the fossil fuel industry. You don't have to keep spending money to find new sources of fossil fuels. You know, you've built the system and it can run very cheaply relatively to operate the systems once they've been built. And, uh, you know, heat pumps, Neil was talking about the heat pumps and heat pumps outsold natural gas furnaces in the U.S. last year. There are over 4 million units sold. The technology has greatly improved in the last year or two for heat pumps. There's portable units that can go into apartments, and those are wonderful technologies. I mean, the heat pump is an ideal technology for addressing climate change, and that's part of this uh, Tesla plan as well. So I think it, they did a very good job with this plan. I hope uh, you know they have contacts with governments to actually start getting these things done. So very interesting. Well, thank you, Paul. Thank you for acknowledging the, the Tesla plan and filling us in on the, the level of volume of heat pump sales in the US and various things. I wanted to mention another aspect of the paper that perhaps maybe would surprise people is that they also say that the resource availability is not a problem with this plan. We have the, and when I say resources, I'm talking about the minerals that are required to produce these batteries, to produce the various elements of the renewable energy system. And they are saying that contrary to people's belief that the availability of various uh, mineral ores are decreasing as we use them. They made a point of saying that as we're using these elements, we're finding new sources. And in fact, the supply and availability of minerals is actually increasing. So they, they kind of juxtapose two graphs, 
one showing decreasing availability of uh, resources over time, juxtaposed with the opposite. And most prominent uh, of all was lithium, which apparently is more ubiquitously available than most people realize. He was even proposing that there's enough lithium in the U.S. alone to power the renewable energy economy for the world. So I thought that was interesting. Of course, there's huge environmental impacts of mining that lithium, certainly using current technology. A lot of it's coming from Chile and it's destroying some fairly scarce water resources. So whilst undoubtedly there's enough material out there in the Earth's crust, it's, uh, you know, how sustainable is it to to mine it? But uh, to back Tesla up, my experience 20 years ago was... The European Union introduced uh, mandatory catalytic converters for every new vehicle to reduce exhaust pollution. And uh, environmentalists are saying, well, that's impossible. There's not enough platinum in the world to build all these catalytic converters. And that was a widespread view. And then magically that was resolved. You know, as soon as there was a demand, the, the miners, the capitalists managed to put the resources into the search for new sources of platinum. And we never really heard about that issue again. So I suspect the same will happen with lithium and with copper. But there will be an environmental price to pay somewhere on the planet. Probably not in our backyards, but somewhere else. Yes, I agree. That's, that's a good point, Neil. And Elon did say that the hardest one to gain supply over is, is nickel. It's just under 30% of the current supply that they have. 30% is required to provide minerals for the renewable energy. And he emphasized that the nickel is really a key element in the uh, higher density, energy density batteries. But he said that Tesla, I know Tesla firsthand, they're, they're uh, using more of what's, what are called lithium iron phosphate uh, batteries now, which don't include nick nickel or cobalt or rarer type elements. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Well, Canada is fortunate with our supplies of nickel. You know, many millions of years ago, the region that Sudbury sits on was hit by a uh, object from space, probably an asteroid or comet. And there's huge amounts of nickel that were in that and buried, you know, under Sudbury with the impact. So they're only tapping a very small percentage of the nickel available there. You know, it's just one example. There's other areas in the Canadian North uh, that, you know, are very high in a lot of these minerals that are needed to support the transition to renewables. So Canada is, is opening up a battery plant in a few years at, at a few different locations to try to use some of these rare minerals and well nickel's not rare but minerals that are vital for the renewable industry you know rather than just mining the ore and shipping it for somebody else to process for batteries etc it makes far more sense environmentally to to do the processing the industrial processing to generate the batteries etc close to the source of where the minerals are coming from i think that's what the push is in in ontario that's that's happening and there were some interesting statistics in the report saying that the total volume or tonnage of resources extracted for an electric future would actually be less than the total resources extracted for fossil fuel society. I haven't checked out those figures. Uh, I guess the argument is that there's an awful lot of coal, oil and gas being extracted from the ground and that's required continuously. Whereas for the electric future, you need to extract your lithium and nickel almost on a one-off basis to produce the the infrastructure, the electric cars, the wind turbines, the solar panels. Okay. But once they're built, um, they're more or less self-sustaining for decades. So that's a, quite an interesting argument. Again, I'm sure there's a lot of subtleties to it. You're extracting oil and gas. A lot of it's fairly hidden deep underground. And so there'll be some environmental impact at the surface, but not the same environmental impact as these huge open cast copper, nickel, lithium mines. So yes, I think there's a lot more to look into into that area, but it's, it's an interesting argument because so many of my friends are 
saying, oh, Neil, you've bought a battery, but, you know, think where are the materials coming from and is that really sustainable? And yeah, I think we need to push back and say, yes, that is the future. Once I've bought the battery, it can be used for decades and at the end of its life, it can be recycled and reused in, in, in any case. The, the other thing, Charles, that you mentioned, of course, is end use efficiencies to reduce energy usage uh, 50%, you know, which is a very important part of the Tesla plan. You know, it's very doable. If you look at the transportation industry, for example, you know, as we push to electric cars, I think the push to driverless electric cars could become very important because there's no reason for there to be as many cars on the roads. I mean, we could operate easily with just 10% of the cars on the road. People don't need to own cars, right? They can just, you know, if there were enough of these autonomous, say, electric cars within cities and traffic speeds are lower, so they should be operating quite more safely, you know, in, you know, city speed, maybe 30 to 50 kilometer an hour speeds, if they're very convenient and widely accessible and people can call them up and they come within a minute or two, which is quite often the case with Uber at the moment, you know, it's very, very rapid. There's people just driving around and you call if you're in the city, it might be one or two minutes they come to your street corner. So that sort of thing alleviates the need to have all of these private car owners, the electric yeah. cars. So we could reduce transportation energy usage by much more than 50%. You know, if only one in every 10 people owned cars compared to today, today's number, we could have a much more efficient transportation system. I, Plus, public yes, I agree, Paul. I agree. In well. fact, I um, sent out a video and there's this fellow, his name is uh, Tony Seba or Seba. Tony Seba, he's kind of one of these futurist guys and he has this company that he has, I think it's called Rethink X. And he was mm. forecasting that by 2030, there would be a 75% decline in demand for cars, you know, and this will be, from what I understood, will be primarily driven by full self-driving. When full self-driving comes online, you know, it will have a, a big impact. So, Peter, uh, I'm just curious uh, if you have any thoughts on any of this. I, th I think we have a huge PR job. As I say, it was particularly interesting to hear of Neil's success on a home-based transition. But everybody, of course, has to do that. I, I live in the city of Victoria, and there are very, very few uh, solar panels on any houses here, which, you know, is, is really absurd. I think going along with um, uh, with a big PR project, which, by the way, I recall was in the 2006 Stern Commission report on climate change, I think people need to be better informed, perhaps. I, I get the impression, and uh, uh, there's reasons for this, that people may think that we're getting more renewable energy, we're getting more infrastructure, and that's just going to take care of it. Well, of course, it's not. And um, uh, I'm not blaming people there because I'm sure they get the impression that because of the uh, uh, very encouraging numbers on electricity production from renewables, they may think that everything's being taken over by renewables. Well, of course, as we know, that's way far from the truth. I think the market share of what we would call true clean renewables is still only a few percent. So we need to have regulation. We need to have governments immediately stop subsidies. That needs a global activist campaign. God knows why there is still no campaign. There still isn't to uh, stop, force governments to uh, stop all subsidies unconditionally. None of these weasel words around them like so we'll stop inefficient subsidies, you know. And we need big promotion for everybody to do what uh, Neil has already successfully done. Well, thank you, everybody, for contributing to today's discussion on the Tesla Master Plan Part 3. I thank everybody for joining us today on the Climate Emergency Forum. And if you learned something, please like the video, please share it. And if you haven't already, subscribe. So we look forward to seeing you on the next Climate Emergency Forum.